Like previous raid videos I have made, I like to give you context as to why stakes are high, emotions higher, and challenge a true pinnacle. This was the wildest day the Destiny community would ever see. Wilder than any dungeon, any puzzle, hell, any raid day. That may sound insane, seeing as I have already made a video on the wildest 24 hours in Destiny history. The story of the near 19 hour clear of the raid Last Wish, and all of the things that happened afterwards. You just have to believe me when I say that this video goes into some absurdity. And you just have to believe me when I say there is just so much to talk about. If you are new to my channel and don't know my videos well, if this video is a good one for you, or even if you aren't subscribed at all, I do encourage you to subscribe. It helps me and my team keep making more videos more often, and it only takes a full second to press the button. So please consider subscribing. So why was this race the wildest one we have ever seen? <sighs> Let's just start at the beginning. This is the start of the DLC, The Witch Queen. We won't be staying here very long, but what's important to take away from this were the changes that were made to the Witch Queen that heavily affected Raid Day for Destiny players. I want to make a quick note that if you aren't familiar with Destiny and its long 8 year run, you may be confused. But my whole channel goes over a lot of the game's stories from the community's perspective. So I encourage you to watch those as this video gets into some pretty detailed inspections of the game and its player base. I won't be holding back and explaining every last part, but I will do my best to illustrate what I am saying. The Witch Queen launched on February 22nd, and Bungie started off by dropping a bomb an hour before the Witch Queen's release, with major changes to the sandbox. The biggest of all of them being the change to Protective Light, a mod Destiny players held onto for years because of just how necessary it was. Protective Light is a mod that works by giving the player a 50% damage resist when they get to critical health, at the cost of all stacks of being charged with light. Charged with light mods are mods that need a starter, like taking charge and shield break charge to get stacks of charge with light. An example, picking up an orb with the taking charge mod or breaking a shield with the shield break charge mod would get those charges and store them for use. You can see how easy it is to get charged with light. So having a 50% resist always in your pocket makes even the hardest challenges completely mitigated because you're always going to have another health bar to play with. Just because 50% resist is very strong. The reason it's important that I say all of this is because an hour before the Witch Queen dropped, Bungie sent out some patch notes. A patch which nerfed the hell out of protective light, dropping its resist from 50% to just 10%, while buffing the Well of Tenacity perk from 10% resist to 50% resist. Now I know what you're thinking, that sounds like a one-to-one -one swap and the exact same thing happening, but they are far from it. Elemental Wells require the player to move towards them. They require other means to proc. There is at least a harder step involved, and they also don't last long with a short timer on them. This was part one of massive changes to make players uncomfortable going into the new content. The other changes that definitely had impact going into day one was the 40% primary exotic weapon buff. This completely changes the meta loadouts players could use, and the biggest fear that really wasn't changed on day one was stacking 1-2 punch, various titan exotics for melee damage boosts, and shield bashing. Players were rightfully terrified that this race was going to get run over by the damage combo stacks, and the fact that Bungie didn't put them on a banned loadout list. I want you to have a look at how much damage this combination does and tell me if you would have banned it. Speaking of that banned weapon list, 
we had an assortment of disabled mods and banned weapons going into this raid, including the infamous Wardcliffe Coil, which for some reason was doing more damage than the Gallahorn. Teams prepared for all these changes as best they could, and with the contest cap of 1530 power for day one, everyone had time to acquaint themselves with the Void 3.0 changes, the new weapon metas, everything new. Hell, even the servers worked on day one for the Witch Queen. You have to remember, raid races are the pinnacle of Destiny content, and this is actually the longest players have had to wait for a new raid in Destiny ever. I don't mean to take anything away from the remastered Vault of Glass, but it isn't a brand new raid, it's a remaster, and there was a long delay from Beyond Light to the Witch Queen. That means it has been one year, three months, one week, and five days since Deepstone Crypt came out back in November of 2020. Guys, that is 469 nice. days, longer than the previous record held by Deepstone Crypt of 403 days. So, would Vow of the Disciple live up to the hype? Would the raid go down in history as one of the best ever made? How did Raid Day go? The encounters, the loot, the players racing, the story, the future of Destiny. Everything all encompassed in one. Join me on a story unlike any other for Destiny, and brace yourself for the wildest day the game would ever see. That's a word, Yeah, it's a triangle thing. I hear some of the footage in this video is from players around the community, and their links are in the description in this video, as well as the music too. Well then, Guardians mine, enjoy, have fun, and play on, because it won't last. Also some footage, EvanF1997 on Twitch. I play a lot of raids with my community over there, so join in, hang out, and come game with me. I also have a community clan that anyone who is looking to game Destiny can join. Any platform, just don't be an asshole and you can join the clan. Links to both down below. Player life, be accountable, 10 o'clock, here we go. Alright, here we go! Here we go! Here we go! Battle of the Disciple, baby! Let's go! Alright. Cookies, baby. Focus up, boys. Here we go. <laughs> Welcome to the Vow of the Disciple raid. A raid that immediately wastes no time getting into the action. I want you to know that for this video, we will be following as many teams around as possible, and that not everyone could get their clip in. There were a lot, so I do apologize in advance if I didn't include yours. Immediately, teams were off to the races, literally and figuratively. As the raid starts off with Marasov talking, and then being interrupted by a brand new voice, a diabolical one, a voice named Rolk. Welcome, children of light. Drown in the deep. Or rise from it. Rolk we will talk about later, but the point is that the raid race was in full swing. While this raid wasn't the most participated in of all time, it was much higher than Deepstone Crypt. Only a little bit less than Vault of Glass, a raid that players are very familiar with, but not that much lower than Leviathan, which was Destiny 2's very first raid. 
with more than 380,000 people watching along on Twitch alone and many thousand more on YouTube. You could see crowds gathering in the masses to witness this monumental day. The first encounter was sort of a crossover between Destiny and Overwatch, maybe an Overwatch 2 beta. Players had to kill a vision of Savathun and then Sparrow to this payload. Kill some... Scorn ads? Yeah, this is a Scorn raid. Something the Destiny community has been wanting for a long... Well, not me, but the community wanted for a long time. Scorn raiders start immediately sniping at the players. Abomination zapping players. And screams, well, screams. Fueling up the car with some swamp darkness gas and off to the next station. The problem was that this car needed to be filled a lot, but players mostly scooted through this encounter, if you'd really call it an encounter. You could respawn as many times as you'd like to. Once through, players entered the pyramid. Oh. Well, that's fine. Just an error code, those happen, and I'm sure only some teams will experience them, right? Just load back in, do the entrance again, and... <sighs> Cross section, oh my god. Let me see him. Oh, oh, oh. we got a guitar. We got a guitar? Yeah. Whenever we get time, if there's lost ciphers. I, I just got, got, got an anteater. I got an anteater. That's them. Is anybody else still in? No. We still did. All right. When we go through that part, everyone get off the boat. They're much bigger than this. Oh, I got. Oh, I, I just got guitar. Guitar. I got guitar. guitar. So many teams were stumped at entering the raid due to error codes, and Bungie help was quick on the case, letting people know that they were investigating the error codes Anteater, Guitar, and Bat, which are all network-related error codes. This isn't the first time we have seen error codes in raids. Last Wish being the biggest example of error codes, with Guitar and Bat being massive problems in that raid at times. Hell, Beaver has even become a household name outside of raiding. But the raid boss in the entrance might have just been named Anteater. This is the first part of the wild story on day one. The error codes that slowed some teams down. Some had no problems at all with errors, while other teams like Team Redeem spent up to two hours stuck at the front door's entrance. This may not seem like a huge deal to some. Raid Day is Bungie's biggest chance to bring in new spectators to the game. The perception of Destiny 2 to the outside community Hell, even some of you good-looking viewers who aren't Destiny players get a taste of what the pinnacle content the game can offer truly looks like. So having error codes may not be new, but on a day one stage like this, this was absolutely new. Nobody knew what to do, and these error codes would happen in the next encounter. Way worse, as on a personal note, I went back and counted how long my own team was plagued by error codes, and it was close to six hours stuck in here. A lot of emotions were expressed, and I can only imagine what was going on at Bungie HQ. But raid racers had to be ready for this challenge. And it really did test the mental of a lot of competitive teams. This raid race is difficult to cover who was in the lead at all times, because the errors on day one kept shuffling that around, and unfortunately, there are even more problems that racers would face out of their own control later on. Players were desperately calling for Bungie to kick everyone out of the servers and reset the raid day to a further date or just until the servers could handle all the traffic in the raid. But Bungie did not do this, and I can't fully blame them either. I know that sounds crazy, but hear me out. Think about it. How many people can raid race on a Saturday they plan months in advance for versus another one soon after? What about the teams that made it further and learned some new intel? They would have an advantage, right? No matter how you feel, Bungie didn't pull the plug early and instead got to work behind the scenes to fix it. Some teams got through with no problems or without many problems, while others were stuck in purgatory for a very long time. 
I want you to also not think that these error codes decided worlds first. Because that is another part of how wild this day was. So before a war starts in the comments, just keep watching. Aside from error codes, the environment of the pyramid was tremendous, and different than even the pyramid on Europa. There were calcified worms chopped up, aliens we have never seen calcified too, and just so much different from the rest of Destiny. We have talked about how raid environments being so different from the rest of the game is fantastic. Vow of the Disciple does not disappoint at all. Welcome to the first encounter in this raid. With a giant bone in the middle, a tremendous amount of symbols throughout the room, and a, a worm god in the background. A living worm god. The gods that gave the witch queen her powers in the background, powering a beacon above. The atmosphere of this raid was becoming unmatched and we are only on the first encounter. The voice of Rolk came back to introduce the player to the acquisition. The witness sees light fall, glimpses you free of chains, boundaries, truly limitless potential, domination unbound. This room introduced racers to the many symbols they would have to remember in the raid. And trust me, this raid has cemented itself as an LFG, or looking for guardians, nightmare. Last Wish was known to be the most symbols for Destiny players to remember, with 16 callouts to remember. But within each callout, there were multiples, like Fish Up and 69 Fish. Nice. With Vow of the Disciple, there are 27 callouts to remember, and none of them are the same. A very observant player would be rewarded for their time, however, because in one of the rooms before acquisition, you can scope in on all of the symbols, and Bungie gave them all names. These names have more importance that we'll get to later on, but yeah, racers didn't care, and even the fact that Bungie let you go back to the room to observe the symbols was ignored by most. But what I'm curious about is the callouts you had for some of these symbols. I'll go in order for me based off this picture. My callouts on day one were <clears throat> Sticky Hands, Witch Queen, Refraction, Ink, Witness, Explodey Head, Tower, Hole, Pyramid, Entrance, Invasion, Guardian, Red Square, Brain, Traveler, Forsaken, Nothing, Black Sun, Rainbow, Bold, Nail, Snake, Savathun, Jesus, Mesa, and Flower. Yeah, I know. Kind of ridiculous at times. For the sake of this video, we will go off of what Bungie has named these callouts. Teams were struggling, not only with error codes here, but on what the hell to do? There were totems. There were... Taken Knights? There were Scorn too? Yes, this was the second time there has ever been a multi-enemy raid. The first being King's Fall, which featured Hive until the final phases, where the Taken would come into play. I know some people will definitely want to count the Leviathan with Eater of Worlds and Spire of Stars, but this is my video, and I am not counting those. So, we have 27 symbols, a worm god in the background, we're inside a pyramid, and there's a new voice talking to us while we deal with the first encounter. The first encounter was a puzzle encounter, and explaining this one to a new player could definitely take some time. I will start with what players were supposed to do. There are three totems in the room, and three glyphs per side too. The goal was to kill some enemies, then one of these glyphs would appear with a symbol, pyramid or traveler. This was the sign to where to find the first taken knight, either corresponding with the traveler logo, or the pyramid logo in the middle. Once the knight was killed, that totem would also get a symbol of a door to enter in the room. If this door was closed, 
the team would need to shoot the pyramid in the middle to open the door. If open, the players would enter to a dark room with a dark and light symbol on each side. The final glyph would appear to shoot dark or light and kill the corresponding Scorn Chieftain, all the while avoiding screams. Once killed, the Chieftain would leave behind another symbol for players to remember. Once all three glyphs had all three corresponding Chieftains dead and symbols written down, the final step was to find one of three totems that had all three of those symbols. If you found the right one, just shoot the symbols and the totem would accept your offering. Starting the next round of three total and needing the team to rotate to the next totem when the time came again. If you were too slow, or allowed the ads to shoot the totem a lot, or just flout out wrong with the callouts, the totem would reject your offering and eventually the ritual would conclude killing the team. This encounter is really cool to me, since it's a puzzle encounter like Vault from Last Wish, but you can speed it up a lot by finding the knight and killing the enemies quickly. I personally dislike encounters that are mostly ad clear, but this one stands out above almost all of them, since you can take measures to speed it up. Now that you know what to do, here are some examples of what teams thought you had to do. Shoot both chieftains. Shoot every symbol. Shoot them at the same time. Niobe labs it and just keeps shooting the wrong symbols since that would definitely work, right? Shoot all three totems at the same time. Just a whole lot of wrong puzzle solving that could work, which is really tough because if you lucked into solving it, you probably thought the game was just being bad and like we discussed with the error codes, Teams didn't know if they were wrong or if the game was screwing them over. There were a few teams through, but the one that we know of to be the first through was N.A. Painter, Paul the Wall, Peach, Huey Tato, Ghost, and Vex Legends. One important note to make with this raid race is that Destiny players brought in coaches for their teams. Not every team had someone coaching them and pulling info of what other teams were doing, but the contenders mostly had someone helping out. I want to draw a line in the sand and say that this is not cheating, and is actually a common place in MMO World's First races, like World of Warcraft. Since it's a race, and knowing what to do if you're playing from behind is very important. There were coaches like Tifu returning for Redeem, Nanowatts, another world's first winner returning to coach math class, and just a lot more assistance going into this raid. I know my team had a coach helping me as best he could too. It's not that it's an unfair advantage, it just shows how far raid racing has come. From very few teams attempting and not knowing what was going on in the Vault of Glass, all the way to so many people attempting a race, that it broke the servers and teams wanting coaches to cruise through the raid with. You may not be a fan of it, but it's the natural progression of a raid race, especially with how many people attempted this raid race. Everything that is allowed is allowed for a reason. Back to the race though, teams that could get through the Anteater boss and the encounter caught this team relatively quick. As two teams from Ascend and the main team from Math Class were the next closest to his team. After acquisition came our first boss. May I shake your hand? I what the shit are you? What are you here? Yeah, yeah, that's the that's the that's the dude in the top there, no? Yeah, we're, we're, we got a good argument, so this isn't, this isn't the incoming. Welcome to the Caretaker, the first boss of this raid and one of my favorite encounters Bungie has ever made. In the room rightfully named the Collection, Caretaker stands. Rolk did have some more lines for the player first. Not kings, not gods, disciples, prophets. Savior's serving existence, an undying purpose, a privilege. Anyways, 
The caretaker really was like one giant librarian, and you did not want to piss this one off. Once you came deep enough into the arena, you got the objective to not disturb the caretaker. On raid day, this boss and room were going to be an absolute nightmare for teams. So, the encounter required someone to go into the dark rooms to grab symbols and shoot the totem with the corresponding symbols when they came out. For these players, the goal was to avoid the taken wizards and a pervading darkness timer that made it hard to see, and would kill you at times 10. For the 1-2 to two players that ran in there, their task was stressful, yet simple. Just remember what you picked up and have the totem work with you as the challenge. Now I know what you're thinking, just use a blinding grenade launcher here, that's an easy choice, right? But with how much damage this boss needed on contest, you couldn't even use those in here. Trust me. The same message appeared when the player got the symbols correct as the first encounter. And once nine symbols were shot correctly, the damage could start. Now for the other four players, it was absolute hell outside. With taken vandals on the sides, scorn enemies all around, the boss shooting darkness cockroaches in the air for you to shoot, and the boss himself. The caretaker would make his way up one of the sets of stairs, and the team outside was in charge of stunning him in place to slow him down, or else he would be in the way of the glyph readers and make the job almost impossible to get done in time. This would give enough time for damage, which was on three different plates at a time, and the starting damage phase plate was decided by which set of stairs the boss went up. This boss had a lot of health, and was health gated on the first portion of plates. For day one racers, this was more of an indicator of where you were going to need to get to, as this was a tight damage check. And this was the first time that I can remember in Destiny that having the best of the best god rolls really did matter for a boss giving even more reward for racers who grinded those precious god rolls the year before, and even more incentive for new players to enhance perks at Bungie's new crafting table in the Witch Queen. The main damage used here was a divinity, Thunder Crash Titans with the Curus of the Falling Star chess piece, and a lot of god roll reads regret linear fusion rifles. First in last out god rolls with a Luna Faction Well for more range, and finally, the return of Outbreak Perfected. A gun that I never thought I would see used again in a day one raid. But this raid is full of surprises. Speaking of those surprises, we have Phase 2, which had stairs drop down the arena for players to follow up and do the same task a floor above. The only job that really got harder was for the players in the dark rooms, as the rooms got larger, so finding those symbols in time became more challenging. After phase 2 of damage, and the check there with the health bar, teams were usually struggling on ammo, and after another room that became even larger in the dark for the seekers and on the third damage check, it was time for final stand. What? Are you kidding me? Yeah, that's it. At least it overcome. No. He's dead. He's dead. He's dead. He's dead. Yes, dude. It's better kill, it's better kill. Let's go! Let's go! Let's fucking go, man! I would've fucking Good cried. shit. <laughs> <laughs> that was so close! Oh, like, clinch mode, didn't it? Let's there we go, go. Yeah, that's something. Resident Teams would fall to the damage check Final Stand had, as this was not only a tough challenge for damage, 
but a long climb to get back here to even attempt a better damage phase. Now the other problem that the team of Twicemas, Krusty, Mape, Maxim, Kaiser, and Sat would experience, especially when they were leading the race at the time, was after beating Caretaker, the game softlocked them? Uh, uh, we're softlocked. I assume. No, no, no. There's softlocked. Chat, are we softlocked? No, no, no. We're softlocked. Mm -hmm. There should be stairs here. Yeah. Alright, chat. I'm closing chat again. We're actually softlocked. I love the Bucky Rage. <laughs> The only solution to this was not redoing the encounter, as this would keep them at the soft lock. But instead, they had to do the entire raid over again. This was another part of the wild day that was Vow of the Disciple raid race. Soft locking teams here, and as a bonus bummer, not even dropping loot from the chest either. Speaking of which, Another Ascend team ended up stuck at the entrance of Caretaker. This is like a tomb or something. I think you guys gotta explore. Uh, this feels buggy. Yeah. We're not meant to be in here. And also, funny enough, Math Class ended up at this encounter with no boss in the room. At this point, if you're still watching this video, I want to ask you. Would you rather be error coded or soft locked? My choice? I just want to play the damn game. And I know that this was heartbreaking for this team as they were gunning down this raid to this point. They were not the only ones affected by this. As Redeem, Rare Drop, and even our former champions of Vault of Glass Remaster, Elysium, and countless others had this problem too. Bungie HQ, I am sure, was in an all-out panic and was not prepared for what was taking place on the grandest stage in the world. To hundreds of thousands of spectators, Bungie help constantly saying they are investigating and teams suffering as a result. But there is a saying, the best teams can climb back in the face of defeat. So while some teams were getting the brunt of the problems, those same teams kept a focused mental and on the grand stage for the chance to come back. Let's follow those who were leading the charge and didn't get softlocked at Caretaker though. Ascends Team 1 and Math Class, who were both fortunate enough to not have too many issues and started zooming through here. Outbreak, outbreak, outbreak. Come on, Maybe. come on. Yeah, there you go. Lower face, lower face, lower face. Look out! Loot up. Seekers. Shooting oh. death as well. Good shit. Wait, wait, maybe something, maybe, maybe something. Maybe something. Yeah, seekers, seekers, seekers. Might be not over. Okay, we're Chest. Chest. I know the times may feel weird, so let me just take a step back and help you out. Ascend was well ahead of everyone else. After Math Class didn't have a boss for a while, they eventually reset and would eventually catch up. But Ascend was zooming to first place. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there has been a lot in this video so far. And I know, after those first two encounters, all the problems, all the teams racing, everything included, there has been a lot in this video so far. So, let's take a nice break and chill through this jumping puzzle. You guys have absolutely crushed it on the merch for the Witch Queen. And we have a new design I cannot show you until we get to the final boss without spoiling that. That is also limited time. So please check out the link below to the collection if you're interested. These go away in a month from now. So go fast because you don't want to miss them. Listen guys, even the jumping puzzle in this raid is not free. Having an eager edge sword for that fast speed was needed here, or some really good detective work to find the way to properly get up there. The key to the jumping puzzle was to shoot the pyramid in a room and move the platforms that way. Honestly, it's something new, and I don't think players were expecting Bungie to make a good jumping puzzle that has an actual puzzle. 
I will just say now, good luck to players going for Flawless, because this one is pretty unforgiving. Once somebody makes it through every part of the puzzle portion, the path does come together, but it's still not free. There's plenty of blind jumps, and there's plenty of spots where I know players are gonna die. Once past the jumping puzzle, and past some other secrets we'll talk about later, it was time for our third encounter, and one of my favorites Bungie has ever made. Terminal resonance. Oh, oh, I have a thing. Terminal resonance. I have one. I have a glyph keeper here. Glyph keeper. Have... So I got that. I need somebody else. It sounds like. Terminal the resonance. Let me know the terminal resonance. Oh, sorry. The white shields. What the fuck? Oh. Okay. I have got to say, if you like fast-paced encounters that require teamwork, then exhibition, exhibition is your encounter. I absolutely love the way this one was designed and everyone at Bungie should pat themselves on the back for this encounter. The exhibition encounter used the symbols from the raid but introduced a new relic. This darkness relic which is not a new idea but it's executed well here. Later into the encounter there is even this Aegis from Vault of Glass and the taken relic from Last Wish? What? Yeah, this encounter was a relay race unlike any other you have ever seen before. Guns blazing, timers ticking, and scorn and taken everywhere. The goal was for one side of callouts after killing a glyph keeper to be seen by relic holders, while the other side could see it without the relic. So moving fast and coordinating the matching callouts was absolutely necessary in a short time frame. What happens if you don't kill the ads in time? You're dead. Don't get the symbols down in time? Dead. Don't kill the knight with the shield? Dead. After each round, if you'd call it that, the teams had to deposit the relics for the next set of players to pick up and change jobs. This overarching timer was here the whole time, so there was no downtime from once you started till it ended. The timer that could kill you was tied to the new darkness relic, and needed a shielded knight killed to add time to that timer. This was only more insane because the Vault of Glass Aegis was needed to cleanse the team from wiping to another internal timer, and the Taken relic was needed to cleanse the area of Taken Blights to kill some adds that were immune. The first couple of rooms were relatively easy, but that third room is where it became absurd. But like, was it I don't like the same way they need it. Ghost left? We're, we're not wiped yet, bro. Yeah, I mean, we are because of timer. Do you have this split? Okay, so I, the glyph keepers have set spawns. We, we just need people to camp them and then call out when they see here. Shooters, you see it. No, I can't I don't see where to bank a relic. So it's after the relic, it's after the glyphs part. So we have probably to kill us. Yeah, you can only switch you can only switch relics after you do a phase. Lit lit people three and three. No, 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 the top. Holy shit! I'm just gonna throw a nade on. I'm gonna Sorry. be dead at top. I need a res. I'm got moving towards the I'm gonna res me or at least okay. have data. Did we have life? Hey, we Fucking did. insane. Like. Now once teams eventually made it past that room and onto the final one, the new challenge was platforming through. Warlocks were going to have a nightmare here, and the relic was going to find its way off the map eventually. But with some good strategy and some really good memory, teams were able to get through here. Uh, Hive Eye Square Witch Queen. I think Witch Queen is the same, right? Uh, Hive Eyes, where's, where's left Square, left? Witch Queen. That's right, Paul. Well, le left needs to stop. Where can we extend? I don't see one. Extend middle, extend middle, extend middle, extend middle. Triangle Square. Okay, we got the Square. Put him in, put him in. Put him in. Good shit, good shit. Scream, 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 scream. 
All right, pick it up and put it in. I think this might be lost. Pick it up, pick it up, pick it up. We have time, we have time, we have time, we have time. Put it in, monks. We have time, we have a minute. Is it done? It's just be done. No, we have to pick it up again. Um, pick it up. I can't, I can't pick taken. No, it's it, it's it. Oh, it's it. Let's go, boys. Good, good shit. Keep it up. I, I need to pee. I need to pee. That's a banger encounter. Resilient. That's really good on the final one. We did That's really like good on Ascend's team one was crushing this raid race and was through the next portion in just three hours and 34 minutes. And we're talking totals here. Let's check back at some of our other racers though, as by this point, some more teams started getting past the Anteater boss and Softlock boss completely. We have Elysium who had just made it to the third encounter, but was still getting some error codes here and there. We have Math Class who had just beaten Caretaker and was on their way to the third encounter. As for a lot of other teams in the race, they were around similar points, getting kicked to orbit or still dealing with the softlocks. Team Elysium had to repeat the acquisition encounter three whole times because of this. But now they weren't extremely far behind Ascend who was charging through the rest of the raid. I do want you to take one more breather after exhibition because I know that encounter is really fast paced and I want you to take in the view just one more time. I heard that you guys wanted something free. Yes, free free. No, I'm not joking. Just go to the Gamersubs link in the description, get some free samples and type in code 300k because your boy is getting at least somewhat close to 300k, right? Hey look, it even happens to be free shipping worldwide on any order over $30. That's what, one tub? Link in the description, ladies and gentlemen. The next jumping puzzle section had more pyramids to shoot open and reveal a path, and this time, some glyph keepers to kill in order to lower the platforms. The goal was to group up next to a door on the left or right side, but most people on day one pulled out the eager edge sword and got busy for the next encounter. This happens to be the final encounter. I want you to meet Rolk, first disciple of the witness. You have served your purpose. All that awaits you now is the gift of death. The darkness beyond your final days. These things don't see themselves as gods, no. They believe themselves so much more than that. Symbols on the ground. What the fuck? What the hell? <laughs> oh, these disciple of the witness. Ascend was all alone, and on the final boss of the raid, Rolk. Before we get to the final fight, can we just talk about Rolk for a moment? The design of this boss is absolutely fantastic, and he is our first ever new enemy in Destiny since Vanilla. I know what you're gonna say, but Evan, there's been Taken, there's been Scorn, there's been Siva, Light Hive, Other Cabal, there's been all these different things. He couldn't be the first. Listen, Bucko, Rolk is the first enemy not associated with Fallen, Hive, Cabal, or Vex. The other ones were either possessed, zombies, or just the same with new names. Rolk is new, and I have to say, my theory about the veil coming to be on light had the right idea, but the wrong math. Rolk is the inspiration for the design of our final piece of merch. And there really is just so much to love about this boss fight. I will say it now. This is the best boss Destiny has ever had for reasons we will explain. But sporting a glaive and a lot of attitude in the kicks, Rolk just fucks. The encounter was simple, yet multi-stepped. Teams had to shoot the darkness above Rolk to grab the Leeching Force buff, and then get hit by Rolk's Fire Blast to get the next buff, Emanating Force. There were Glyph Keepers here like in the previous encounter that needed to be killed, 
and the same matching the symbol mechanic was required, this time to enter Rolk's bubble and bank the buff into the correct totem. Six totems that would all rotate the same symbol, with only two of them being the correct spot to dunk. If dunked wrong, you die. The only threats here were some taken scions, some snipers, and some abominations. But racers were going to be concerned with phase two. After banking six times, Rolk challenged the player with his glaive out like a gentleman, and the arena was now open. <laughs> it's like just so tough because you just have to reorganize a buff. Bro, we, okay, wait, we gotta get both people yeah. in there. This was. Guardian down. Man, this is rough. This was also when teams like Ascend and Math Class muted all communication on streams. Since this is a race, and hundreds of thousands were watching along as they got to the final boss. So other teams knowing what to do could be a major advantage going in. During the silent learning runs, Ascend was making progress, and Math Class was catching up quickly. Okay. Night guy, night guy. Nut, 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 nut. Okay. Right side is rainbow. Go in, go in, we're in, we're in, we're in. Bank it so we get our... Get in, get in, get in, get in, get in, get in. Bank, 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 bank. We're done. We gotta be done. Okay. Oh, man. Oh, that is killer. That loot. Oh, no. Soon after this, Elysium also got their clear. Black triangle. Shot it. Go, go, go. Place the relics and that's it. Don't die, don't die. Dog relic going right. Dog relic right. Dog relic middle. Please don't untitter us. For the love of God. Get it again, get it again. I can't grab it. Can't can't grab it. it. Uh, That's it. Yeah. 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 We, we just like we just had to chill a bit. We wait for 20 minutes until we get our loot, and then we go first try boss. Yep. This is, I don't uh, think this anyone has ever got to damage. Now there were a few teams caught up to ascend, and after over an hour of attempts at the final boss, with still not a full idea on how to do damage and effective damage. The goal for Phase 2 was to shoot Rolk's Glaive after each attack. Rolk had a charge attack akin to a Dark Souls boss, a fire beam attack that spread in multiple directions, and a kick if you got too close to him. Hey. Sir, please. Sir, please. Oh, <laughs> oh. Oh, just to explain what happened on my end, I, he... Rolk had a variety of attacks, and some admittedly bad desync on these attacks too. This boss was straight from a traditional MMO like WoW's Kill Jaden. Every time someone broke Rolk's Glaive, they would get the leeching buff and needed to jump into the fire for the emanating force buff to bank at one of four stations. These didn't change symbols, but the rest of your team had to avoid the Shadow Thrall while giving instructions on where to dunk the buff based on the floating symbol left behind by the Glaive. Once dunked, Rogue's shoulders, then legs, would glow to indicate where to shoot them. If you didn't, the boss wiped you. If you did kill all four spots, then the damage would begin, and the boss went straight into Super Saiyan. Charging up and becoming more chaotic than ever, you best get out of Rogue's way, and you best bring a divinity. Support, give him support. Laser. Damage was rough, and teams struggled here for hours just to get something consistently going. It was now neck and neck between three teams for the brand new belt, and the title of world's first, Vow of the Disciple. Oh well, dashing at us. Yeah. Final, 
Keep, keep going, going, keep going, keep going. Keep going. Keep going. I shot Gally, I shot Gally. Go, 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 go. Keep DPSing, just keep shooting him. I'm t I'm I'm dark I'm darkness nine. Holy fucking Christ! Yeah. We need so much. Dash A we dash A we. The back and forth battle went on for hours, and Ascend was on the cusp of something spectacular. After being here for the longest and with the most focused I have ever seen a raid team, Ascend was poised for another world's first. Div. Diving, diving, Div. diving. Uh. No, dude. Two rockets. Hell, one super. Hell, one snipe was the difference between the kill here. And with Ascend this close, it was back in the air again. So, would math class, Ascend, or our former champs Elysium pull this one off? No, no healing though, power in her company. Dash. Take our time, make sure you guys have ammo. We easily got immune. We're super hey, for, uh, final stance. Yeah. Immune, Rush, immune, no. immune. No, 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 no. Dashing, dashing. Dip this long, dip this full on. Dip full on. Feather, supers. Okay, here we go. Full on. All right. Cool. Here we go. Galhorn's out. Galhorn's out. Watch out. Remember, save your rockets for finals. Don't get hit by the lasers, but we have the same for finals. Watch out for Yeah. Chance. Stay away from him. Get your darkness down. Get your darkness down. Stay away from him. Uh, how much div do you have, Pyros? Are yeah, you good on div? Loading div. Are you? Are you okay, yeah, you're fine. Rockets, just in case, please. Just yeah, rockets, okay. Rockets. Get div on him. Get div on him. Get div on him. Get div on him. Okay. Okay, ready, ready. Go, 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 go. Oh, rockets are out. Rockets get are out. Get div on. Get div on. Go, 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 go. Chaos is in. Middle, 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 middle. I'm gonna die. Reloading. Nice! Okay, no! get chest, get chest in orbit, chest in orbit, find the loot, 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 where the fuck is this shit, dude? Please, 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 please. Please, fucking please. Please, please, please. Please, please, orbit, 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 orbit. Whoever's host, somebody, Cruz? Orbit, orbit, orbit. He's going, he's going, he's going, he's going. Please let it be back to back. Skip the cutscene. Skip the cutscene if there is one. Just skip it. Just skip it. Skip it. Skip it. Skipping. 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 Please let it be back to back, man. Please let it be back to back. Please. Come on. Please, man. Please. Did we just lose that? Team Elysium gets their second belt and repeats for the win in this raid race. The team of Slap, Quaz, Cruz. Kairos, Moople, and Saltagreppo pulled out an absolute heroic comeback story. From being softlocked and error coded like a lot of people were, they pulled this one out. Right behind them, and I mean a damn damage phase right behind them, Math Class finished their race too. Div is on, Div is on the whole time. Div is on the whole time, Div is on the whole time, Div is on the whole time, Div is on the whole time. Come on, come on, come on! Come on. Yes! Ow! Oh. The clear by Team Elysium was in 7 hours and 14 minutes exactly, with Math Class finishing just 3 minutes and 15 seconds behind them. And third place of Team Hard in the Paint, only 12 minutes and 15 seconds behind second two. Let's go! Let's go! Let's go! This race was wild for many reasons, and the wildest one may be just how close this one ended up being. For Ascend, they ended up not finishing for a while after, going down to 26th place. Rolk was just that tough on day one, and I would have to imagine after being that close, it was just heartbreaking runs for a while after. This raid race may not have been fair to all, but if you look at the names at or near the top, you still see a commonality. There may not be every name we're used to talking about, but hell, you cannot take this away from Elysium. They battled back in the face of Anteaters and Softlocks to still claim a world's first. 
you could argue that this race was actually the ultimate test of endurance a raid team could have. So, hats off to Elysium. I actually had the chance to ask the world's first team again a few questions about day one. Here's a listen. What was you guys' biggest struggle on day one? Like, what was the biggest, like, hurdle for day one? I think it was honestly just the endurance of it. Like, after, I mean, at least for me, first encounter, I was like, after clearing it twice and then still getting soft locked, I was just like, all right, this is hopeless. World's first, like, dream is over. I just want to have fun today. Like, hopefully we just get through it. And just forcing myself to, like, continue to want to run that day. That was, I think, the biggest struggle between that and third encounter where we got anteater like at least 15 times in a row. It was just like, dude, I, I don't even want to be here anymore. You threw, you know, Rolk and Val, like that raid came out in year two instead of Last Wish. Do you think Last Wish still would have been harder given the same parameters of contest that we have now? Do you think Last Wish oh, yeah. is the harder raid? I think Last Wish is yeah. harder just purely off the fact that the parts that killed you in Rolk was Rolk one-shotting you. Not many teams had issues with the Scions or the Glyph Keepers or the Abominations. It was just Rolk catching you off. If you stopped paying attention for a second, he would hit you and kill you. And it wasn't, you could be minus 20, you could be minus 100. The actual death would be exactly the same. Whereas in Riven, I think the Ogres hit a lot harder. Riven's fire hits a lot harder just as a general thing. It's not just a one hit or not. And there's just a lot more things that have the chance to kill you in Riven's fight than Rock's fight does. This is like a, you know, include it if you'd like to, don't include it if you don't want to, but like one final thing to say to people that that don't feel like this day one was fully, fully like, with, you know, people that say, oh, there's an asterisk on this or whatever. Like, what do you guys say to them? It's like a final statement. Well, I mean, there's an asterisk on literally everything, any sort of championship accomplishment. Like my connection to that would be like the NBA. Like you could just go through and say, well, this happened because this and then these guys got injured. So that was easy for them. And then that way, that means it doesn't count. So like like asterisks always exist. There's always a reason um, if people are too made up in their own minds to look at both sides of the situation in terms of ours or whatever their opinion is and our reality is, then it's, that's on them. We can't change everyone's mind. Right. For math class, I can only have sympathy since they were that close again. It's better to be second than last, but I feel for that team. I know they are all fantastic players and we'll be back to swing again in the next one. But that is just the sad truth of raid racing. There can only be one winner. Vow of the Disciple was the wildest day one I have ever been a part of. And I believe this was the best day one challenge players had ever gotten to experience. Outside of factors that they couldn't control. I do believe that Last Wish was incredibly hard on day one because of light levels being so difficult that players were 40 under for a while. There are so many other factors too, like loadouts, mods, everything else that goes into it. So it's really hard to judge. Val brought difficulty to contests like we have never seen before. Val had an insane test of tenacity, coordination, and knowledge of the game. While awarding the team with the most endurance through bugs, softlocks, and damage phases, a victory. It has probably become my favorite raid since Last Wish, and with a master mode to come, I can only hope for the best for this raid. That is the Vow of the Disciple raid race, but I am sure you still have a ton of questions. Like, what was that boss? Why is there a giant worm? What do the symbols mean? What does the loot look like? Did Bungie issue an apology of some sort for all the softlocks and crashes? What happened after the raid? Where does raid racing go next? And way more. Well, for the 10 of you still along on the ride with me, first of all, make sure you subscribe. Second, let's get into it. So, 
who is this guy? Well, the short version of who Rolk and what the hell he is doing here, and thankfully, from somebody who is way smarter than me, is that... Rolk. A being of extraordinary dark power. An entity who does the bidding of and follows the witness. The first of its disciples and the last son of a system shattered by darkness. Rulk hailed from a planet known as Lubre, a world that he destroyed himself by the power of the darkness and with his own glaive. Listed amongst his many accomplishments is the role he played in the creation of the Hive and the subjugation of the Worm Gods. One can see the echo of this triumph within his pyramid, where the great Worm Mother Shaita the nurturing still serves as the witness's instrument. Rulk subjugated this worm mother and its children when he came to the ancient world of Fundament. He swam into the depths of the planet's oceans and met a massive creature known as the Leviathan. Despite its enormous size, Rulk grievously injured it and removed one of its ribs. He dropped this rib down into the deepest parts of Fundament where the Leviathan had trapped the Worm Gods. To the Worm Gods, this was a sign that their Jailer was no longer powerful enough to contain them, and that a new power had arose before them. It is here that Rulk struck a Faustian bargain with Shaita, who would see her children, the Worm Gods, enslaved to the purpose of the Witness forevermore. Shaita would be taken to Rulk's pyramid, whilst Yul, Zol, Ur, Aya, and Aka were left to be discovered by the Krill, who would one day be turned into the Hive. Pieces of Shaita, better known to us as Worm Larvae, would be used by Rulk and the Greater Hive Gods to produce endless armies of Dark Followers, who would consume them and would ultimately be tied to the Witness's power, tied to the cause of the Deep and left forever in the thrall of an endless blood tribute that they would have to pay from now until the end of eternity. Rulk would, through his own failures, find himself facilitating the production of these larvae within Savathun's throne world, all while keeping tabs on the fledgling Witch Queen from his own pyramid. After Savathun's rebirth in the light, he was imprisoned within his pyramid by a curse of light placed upon his domain by the Witch Queen. However, in spite of the power of this curse, Rulk would not be left toothless. He would retaliate by using his immense dark power to bring Scorn warriors into Savathun's throne world, warriors that he would then subsequently command with his overwhelming will. Now the Disciple's new dark army marshals to his cause and threatens to consume the throne world in darkness once more. The Caretaker is the first ever worm imbued Scorn, and my man even had his own arms ripped off in the process by Rolk. Someone throw a lab coat on Rolk, please. This is a well-refined mad scientist. This is also tremendous in scale and environmental storytelling, but that is not even my favorite part of the lore. My favorite part is the prophecy that gets told when the Destiny community pieces together the puzzle. After the Caretaker boss fight, a symbol would be displayed against this wall, and the symbol would only be one per raid per clear. By putting every symbol in the correct spot, a prophecy could be displayed. Hive, Scorn, Love, Darkness, Worship, Witness, Pyramid, Fleet, Enter, Earth, Stop, Guardian, Witness, Commune, Traveler, Drink, Light, Witness, Kill, Blank. The last part may be known by the time you were watching this video, but that is insane and makes sense as to why the callouts you can see by zooming in were built this way. It is a prophecy for Lightfall next year, and my god, that is just wild. There is some more lore details that we didn't really have time to discuss, like how you get the lore entries, the mission after the raid. This one 
is just one of the details I love so much about this raid. Another being that you could see where you came from at the end of the raid, and where you were going to end the raid on multiple occasions. The other cool details were released in the art dump Bungie made about Rolf, with references to things I didn't even think would be possible in Destiny. And finally, the preservation mission which shows us a lot and gives us reason as to why the pyramid looks so different from the throne world now versus before when the raid even started. I'm sure Destiny players will learn a ton about this raid this year, and I am sure this isn't the last time we'll be fighting in a pyramid again. We must now face an inevitable truth. The Witness and its followers, they're coming. All of them. And when they get here, we'll finish what they started. Now, another thing you're probably wondering, where the hell is all the loot? the disciple dropped with six weapons and an exotic random drop being the seventh weapon in the mix. With our first ever stasis fusion rifle, the first arc waveframe grenade launcher, with the ability to roll with chain reaction for a stupid amount of explosions. A solar linear fusion rifle with four times the charm and a damage perk that rivals firing line on Reed's Regret. A solid kinetic SMG, our first aggressive burst pulse rifle since Garden of Salvation, Rolk's weapon the Lubre's Ruin Glaive, and the Raid Exotic Pulse Rifle Collective Obligation. These weapons may not all be the best in class, but god damn look at these bad boys they all have some darkness effect and they all are exactly what i look for in a raid weapon being so visually unique from the rest of the game i think it's even cooler that the glaive can be acquired by beating the boss as it leans into the rare drop mmo route that destiny has been missing for a while i don't think the pulse rifle is insane by any means but time will really tell. With the new crafting table, the weapons even have a red, red, red border to get five of them to craft. I've even heard Master will have adept versions too, so be on the lookout for that. As far as the armor goes, it's sort of hit or miss for me with some pieces looking cool, but mostly kinda eh. But then, you may not like it, but this right here, speak performance. Now that we have been through so much and talked about the rest of the raid, we need to talk about the after and if Bungie did something to remedy day one. Vow of the Disciple will always go down in Destiny history as a wild ride. A raid that tested everyone and just proves that sometimes your game is so popular that it can break something so important to all of those people. The definition of suffering from success. And on day one of the Witch Queen, it was surprising that the raid day was just the opposite. Bungie extended the contest window to 48 hours instead of 24 as a form of an apology to make up for the error codes. This led to mixed opinions across the board. But my opinion is that well, before I say my opinion, I kind of want to know what you guys think. You guys think that Bungie should have made contest 48 hours or just left it at 24. Leave me a comment on that one. For me, I don't care that they had contests at 48 hours as I race for placement and for the fun of the competition. If the emblem was a code every year, I would just give it away to you guys as I could care less about a little look on it. I would much rather a tracker on where you finished. I know some people brought up having a gold border for 24 hour clears and leaving the emblem and contest as an option at all times, and I think I'd be okay with that too. I also know that some people hate master raids, since it's a light level contest more than anything. But I actually like master, since it's the final test, and especially with Vow of the Disciple, it will make it remain difficult forever. He says, and then moon repeatable bounty farmers juice up the levels 
to be way over the raid level, making Master easier than normal. I think Vow of the Disciple might be my favorite raid ever made, but it will need time to have an actual call on it. Every encounter is fantastic and provides a harder challenge than years prior. Hell, even the jumping puzzles are not easy, and I could 100% see people not getting their flawless triumphs anytime soon. If this is the quality of raid we get every year, then goddamn is it a great time to be a Destiny player. Through faults and defeat, Destiny players faced a raid unlike any they had ever seen. With some factors out of their control and some factors in their control, Team Elysium was able to pull off something extraordinary. This raid race may be the most complex and wildest one we have ever seen, but at the end of the day, that's exactly what a Destiny raid is. I want to thank you guys so much for watching this video if you made it this far. There will be bloopers at the end, and I'd like to just thank everybody that has made it this far into the video once again. If you're not subscribed to the channel or watching my streams, I encourage you to. It helps me a ton, and it helps everybody that helps out with this channel. There will be a lot more videos coming soon, so be sure to tune in shortly after this. I think it's time we take a step back and enjoy the rest of the game. Thank you so much again, and have a wonderful day. Mm. If he died, it wouldn't count. Oh yeah, it's instant. Oh, I killed him, I killed him! Guys, I actually killed him! <laughs> oh, what? Oh. Crazy. No. What? This man! <laughs> no! I try again. No. If you can res me, I can thunder crash him. I'm getting, I'm getting the res. Thunder crash him. Come on! Shoot him with Come everything! On. Come on! Boys! No! I put a last one. Oh, you're joking! No! No! Wait, I'm lasting! Come on! 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 <笑>なんで落ちるよそれ<笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑>